The fourth Advent candle is the angel candle. It symbolizes the Savior's second coming, his second advent, when he shall return in glory and all his holy angels along with him. Our first lesson for this fourth Sunday in Advent is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. After thousands of years of God's promises, Paul looks back, every one of them, and sees them kept in Christ. God did keep every promise for us in Christ and gives us what we most desperately need, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We read now those precious words of St. Paul. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand to his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his whole earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him, we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Here ends the word of the Lord. Our second lesson today is the gospel from Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. God had come to save his people as just as he promised. He would do it through the child in Mary's womb. Joseph believed the promises of God kept in Christ and named the child the Lord saves knowing full well he was Emmanuel, God with us. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. <clears throat> Matthew 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant to the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Here ends our gospel reading. We continue now with our hymn of the day, hymn number 36.
please stand. The words that you are about to hear is the Old Testament lesson for the fourth Sunday in Advent. It's Isaiah chapter 7, starting in verse 10. I believe it's on page 669 in your Bible. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Holy Spirit, help us to see this sign, to recognize in it you, our Lord and Savior. Amen. In the name of Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us, dear friends. The sights and sounds of Christmas are all around us. That is an understatement. Even the smells of Christmas, the baking and so forth. Colleges already let out, high school soon to follow, people gathering, laughter filling the air. Those are the signs. And then comes this sign that is 2,700 years old. It's a sign that we hold near and dear, but it's a sign that perhaps we don't know the background very well. It's a sign that applies to us and impacts us greatly in two ways, and we'll talk about those two ways as we go along in our message. Maybe what we forget to realize, or we often don't realize, is that this prophecy was spoken by God through his prophet Isaiah to an unbelieving king. And that king's name was Ahaz. Ahaz was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And everything was a mess. Politically, socially, a mess. And Ahaz had faith in something. See, everybody's got faith in something. He had faith in himself. And he also placed faith in the heathen gods around him. We are told in 2 Chronicles 28 that he even offered his sons in the fire. That's what heathen people did in those days. He had faith in that. He also had faith in alliances. Ahaz was very nervous because the king of the northern kingdom of Israel had formed an alliance with Aram, which was a kingdom just north of Israel. So Ahaz thought, okay, I'm going to fight fire with fire. Pekah, the king of the north, made an alliance. I'll make an alliance. I'll put my faith in this alliance. So he emptied out all of the gold and silver, the treasures of the temple in Jerusalem, and gave it to the king of Assyria. Well, I'll form an alliance with the king of Assyria, Ahaz thought. I'll put my faith and trust there. Where is your faith? Where is your trust? We're all tempted. Even Christians are tempted to think, I'll put my trust in myself. Young people here, you might be thinking, I'm bulletproof. I'm invincible because of my youth. I will put my trust in myself, my contemporaries, peers, teens are tempted to think the same thing. Middle-aged people and older people might be tempted to place their trust and their confidence in their wealth and what they can do. Whatever it is, 
See, here's the first way this prophecy impacts us. It develops our faith correctly. Our faith correctly. The Lord had had enough. So he sends Isaiah to King Ahaz. And here's what Isaiah says. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. Make a wish. That's what God was saying. And Ahaz's response sounds very pious at first, but it was a response of unbelief. Here's what Ahaz said. I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Oh, it sounds so righteous. It sounds so pious, but it wasn't. So God said, all right, hear now, O Israel, O house of David, here's the sign. The Lord will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Even though you don't want a sign, here's a sign. Now we hold this verse in high, high regard. We confess it in the words of the Apostles' Creed that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. That's how we understand this passage. And volumes have been written about the little word virgin. And people who want to undo and debunk this prophecy will often say, well, what Isaiah was really saying is that a young girl would give birth out of wedlock to a baby. Well, friends, first of all, that is not a miracle. That is not extraordinary. What doesn't come across so well in the English translation, except in the King James English, is the word behold. See, in the King James English, the word behold is in there. And it's in the original. Behold. It's God's way of saying, pay attention to this. I'm about to say or do something that is very miraculous and extraordinary. And here's what it is. A virgin will be with child. That's an amazing thing. Many centuries later, the angel Gabriel would say to the Virgin Mary, you're going to have a son. And Mary says, how will this be since I have no husband and I have never had sexual union with a man? How can I, a virgin, conceive? It'll be a miracle conception is the answer she receives. And if you're listening carefully, to the gospel lesson that Pastor Baumann read a few minutes ago, at the end of chapter 1 of Matthew's gospel, the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph in a dream. Joseph also is very nervous. He wonders, can I marry Mary? Can I take her as my wife when she is pregnant? And God comes to him in a dream and says, don't be afraid. And there, in no uncertain terms, the word virgin is used. And in fact, this exact prophecy is quoted. This happened to fulfill what is spoken through the prophet. It's talking about Isaiah. And there the word virgin is used. Again. And it said that, furthermore, the angel says, and the scriptures say, that Joseph did not consummate the relationship with Mary until Christ was born. That's the Bible's way of saying she did not have a sexual relationship with Joseph or anyone else for that matter until Christ is born. Friends, this is what Christian faith is all about. I wouldn't have done it this way. You wouldn't have done it this way. This is a, the miracle of Christmas that God becomes a man and this is where our faith lies. This is the definition of Christian faith. This is what you say you believe 
every single week. And it is the heart of your faith. Here's a second way that this old, old prophecy impacts you. It tells you who to have your faith in. Emmanuel, God with us. Pastor Olson said it very well last Sunday, that the God of the universe amazingly comes down to this earth, came down to this earth in the form of a baby. How could that be? That goes against the grain of everything that we possibly think. Jesus, Emmanuel, God, had fingerprints. He had DNA. He had hair that grew. Someone had to cut his hair. God becomes a man. We have a word for that. You just said it in the hymn that you just sang. It's the word incarnation. You use the shortened part of that word. Christ is called the incarnate word. Incarnation is not a reference to a flower. It is not another word for reincarnation. It doesn't mean that God is in a car. It means God, the creator of the universe, became a person, a human being. That, friends, is God's truth. And that's what Isaiah was looking ahead to. So here's the important question for you and me. Why believe that Jesus was God and man rolled into one person? Why is that important? It's important because human beings were reconciled to God through Jesus. It's the only way that it happens. It's the only way that we have forgiveness. Mankind, not males, but men, women, and kids, mankind and God are reconciled through Jesus Christ, the God-man. God demands of us absolute perfection. We can't give it. Jesus did. Emmanuel did. As the God-man put himself under the same constraints that we are under, the same laws we are under, and perfectly obeyed them. And then God justifiably was mad, angry, at who? You and me, for our sin. But he carried out and he redirected that anger to Jesus, unpunished Christ. We call that, here's another big word, vicarious atonement. Say vicarious with me. Vicarious. If you look up the word vicarious in the dictionary, it says to do something in behalf of someone else. The Christian perspective is vicarious atonement means that God, Emmanuel, human being together, did two things. Perfectly obeyed and perfectly sacrificed himself and on the third day rose from the dead. That is the heart and core and the greatest impact for our lives that will ever, ever be. So friends, even though this prophecy was first spoken 2,700 years ago, still rings true for you and me. And not only does it ring true, it has this impact. It calls for faith, it generates faith, it creates faith in Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. We just said it in the hymn, this is a great and mighty wonder. I don't know if you watched the news lately, or listened to it or read it. The world around us is in a mess. Politically, socially, in every way. But friends, this stands true through the ages. That Emmanuel, God and man, as we say in a familiar Christmas carol, are reconciled. So the sign spoken of here still rings true for us.
the greatest sign, save your greatest cheer for Christmas, what God did at Christmas. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please make use of the friendship register as it's distributed. Pass it down the aisle and back again. Then we'll gather the thank offering. We now pause together for prayer and praise to our Lord. Uh, you see your special prayer list and your worship card. We add to that uh, our sister Mary Lobeck, who was hospitalized in the cross at this time as she continues her cancer treatment. We also remember uh, Mike Murray's father and sister. They were involved in a car accident uh, uh, this weekend and uh, involving a, a, a snowplow. Uh, they're in the hospital recovering, and Carla will have surgery for her back. We pray for both Don Murray and, and uh, Mike's sister, Carla, today as well. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, King of glory, who in great lowliness came to earth to be born of a virgin, to bear our sins, to suffer our hell, to die our death, we thank you for your promise to come again, not as the bearer of our sins, but as the deliverer to take us to heaven, our fatherland. Help us to look with longing to that day of power when we will see you face to face and look upon your glory. May the promise of your coming drive sorrow from our hearts and fill us 
with an abiding joy. O ever-living Lord, our hearts desire that all people may share the glorious privilege of knowing you in truth and accepting you by faith. To this end, fill us with your Holy Spirit. We become more diligent and skillful in bearing witness to your salvation in the world. Let not the word of our testimony return empty to you, but use it toward Christian conversations, rightly preparing people for the great day of your coming. Hear us, our precious and only Redeemer. Amen. And precious Redeemer, we ask you to bring comfort to the family of Louise Plenge. Her daughter, Carolyn Zimmerman, is a member of our church family. We pray that you will grant to her and her entire family uh, the certainty that you've taken their loved one to yourself by death. Be with this Christian community of family and comfort them and their sorrow with your sure promises of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. May you also be with a young college student here, Michelle Baronic, who will have surgery this week. We ask you to be with her. We commend her to your care as she undergoes her surgery. We pray that you will grant success to the surgeon and all who assist and bring about a full and speedy recovery. Lord Jesus, we ask you with a grateful heart that you have uh, let Joseph Johnson leave the hospital and now be taken to a care center that he might receive additional assistance and therapy, relieve his distress, strengthen his faith, and grant him a measure of recovery according to your gracious will. Be with our brother, Art Malam, and our sister, Mary Lobeck, as they continue their struggle with cancer. May you be their great physician. May you be their encourager. May you be their provider and caretaker, for they look to you. Relieve their distress, strengthen their precious faith, and also grant them recovery according to your will. Likewise for Don Murray and his daughter, Carla. Be with them as they continue their treatment and their care in the hospital. Grant success to that care and that work. Jesus, all of this we ask today in your name, and now we rise to pray that prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the last two choir selections. You may be seated.
Please rise, friends. We close now with the, the blessing and our final hymn, hymn number 21. Brothers and sisters in Christ, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May look upon each of you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. A couple of brief announcements. First, to acknowledge the goodness of our Lord in granting us so many gifted musicians and vocalists that you heard again today. We thank him for those special additions to our Advent service. Reminder also that uh, if you have not yet picked up your 2017 envelope boxes in the back of the entryway, please do that this morning or pick up for somebody else in your family not here with us. Also, uh, a note that um, we were unable to do our, our neighborhood walk yesterday and, and distribute a number of uh, invitations like this. So we're, what we're going to do today is, is uh, have some young men at the door uh, with greeting with Pastor Bader and I and just distributing those to you. At least take one and give it to a relative, a disconnected friend, an unchurched neighbor or coworker. Uh, take as many as you need. Uh, we have plenty and uh, share with them the uh, invitation to join us for our Christmas Eve and Christmas Day worship services. Uh, we'll have two young men that have not contacted yet, but I'm going to pick on them right now. Uh, Thomas and Dan Wallace, could you pick candies off for me at the door? Okay. And I knew you would, so all right. Thanks, guys. All right. Please take a moment now to greet one another. If you don't know somebody sitting next to you, would you please uh, introduce yourself to them and uh, make their acquaintance. Wish them well.